Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, regular meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee for Monday, June 24th, 2013. Um, I'm Paul Krikorian, Chairman of the Committee, and I'm joined by uh, Council Members Labange and Rosendahl. Uh, we are ready to begin. Uh, if anybody would like to offer general public comment about a matter within the jurisdiction of this committee uh, or comment on any of the agenda items on today's agenda, please fill out a card like this and bring it forward now. As of now, I have no general public comment cards. Um, and we have several on uh, agenda item number one, which we'll be coming to in a moment. So if you'd like to speak, please fill out a card and bring it forward. Um, we have no closed session items today, colleagues. So um, I'd like to begin with uh, clearing some consent candidates, if you agree. Sure. I'd like to propose forward. numbers four, five, six and seven as candidates for approval on consent and without objection that will be the action of the committee thank you very much colleagues um, I'd like to go now out of order uh, to we're still awaiting a couple more members so let's uh, go to item number two on the agenda Item number two is an uh, information technology agency report in response to motion Wesson Buscaino relative to establishing a predictive analytics platform that will help city leaders make better decisions to address and prevent problems before they develop. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Ted Ross, Assistant General Manager with the Information Technology Agency. As you could probably tell from the report, we were requested to provide a report back in regards to predictive analytics and what it would take for the city to establish a predictive analytics platform to assist decision makers in making decisions based on historical or existing data or to try to tackle various civic problems and civic issues. Uh, based on our research, we provide some recommendations as well as some feedback as what it would normally provide. In our report, we provide an example of what the City of Chicago has done, as well as some existing predictive analytics uh, being done within the City of Los Angeles. On the second page, we provide some of the recommendations of what cities typically do. And usually their first step is to actually centralize some of their key city data. And so with that, we even referenced a previous council motion in regards to open data. So often they would centralize data that is housed in various departments, pull it into one central framework so they could review and analyze it. Uh, number two, they often hire chief data officers. They often have someone who could help coordinate and consolidate city across uh, city data across various departments. Uh, then often it was required as a problem statement. It's identifying what the specific issue is and then it's pulling together the analytics tools to go ahead and mine that data. From the fiscal impact perspective, based on these recommendations, the fiscal impact would be in the area of the consolidation of the data. As mentioned before, in regards to centralizing it, which is found on the second to last page of the report, page three. Uh, the cost that we've identified, the rough cost, is usually in the fifty to eighty thousand dollar cost per year. Uh, that is for the vendor services to host a website in which that data would be consolidated. There are additional costs depending on the quantity of data and the variety of data that we would be pulling together, and that would impact departments when it comes to setting up those interfaces. So that's certainly one item. Uh, another item would be the cost of predicting analytics tools themselves. So once again, if we were tackling, let's say, workers' compensation fraud, that could be something that maybe is one amount of cost with one set of data that could, let's say, be in hundreds of thousands if it got into crime prevention or workers' compensation fraud. Or something much smaller could be, let's say, in the thousands of dollars. So it really comes down to the nature of the problem that is being addressed and the, and the types of questions that we're trying to resolve through it. So that's what is uh, substantiated in our report, and that's what we've been discussing and describing here. And you've <laughs> primarily looked at the city of Chicago as a, as a blueprint for this? Well, we looked at a variety of others, but in our discussion with uh, Councilman Wesson's office, they did point to Chicago, city of Chicago, which not only has a very um, robust open data approach, but has also been, has gotten things like Bloomberg grants, et cetera, to go into the areas of predictive analytics. So we used it as one example, but we did look at other major cities, New York City, Chicago, Seattle, Baltimore, San Francisco, et cetera. Yeah, I was just speaking with Mayor-elect Garcetti recently about 
tremendous work that New York is doing, the city of New York is doing in this Absolutely. area. Um, and uh, it sounds as though we have a ways to go uh, to, to catch up in utilization of, of data, so much of which is available to us, and yet we're not, because of our technological limitations, uh, we're not able to really mine those and uh, do the sort of uh, analytical work that we should be doing. So. Like many cities traditionally, we do uh, a specific job within a department often quite well, but sometimes it becomes more difficult to start to take data across departments <clears throat> correlate them and then try to solve issues for our citizenry. And it's a very good example, I think, of how we, in my view, have been penny-wise and pound-foolish in our funding or failure to fund uh, ITA in recent years uh, when we could be getting so much more return on our investment with these sorts of things if we just had a little bit more robust ITA budget and uh, more aggressive uh, forward-looking um, strategy, I think, for the use of, of data. Colleagues? Yeah, I, I would tell you that uh, Eric Garcetti is big into it, <clears throat> which is a real big plus, because the more we embrace it uh, and engage in it, the more effective, obviously, we're going to be in that data information gathering. Fifty to 80,000, is that what you're... Fifty to 80,000 for the annual cost to host and consolidate data. So it would yeah. create a repository in which departments could then start to load the data and it could yeah. become common and shared. And then, and then in your mind, the pitch is 50 to 80,000 is not much money when you consider the benefits of that. I, I would agree, yes. Explain that real quickly. Sure. Well, the reality is you don't really know what you have until you put it all in front of you. Right. And so this is the example from a technology perspective of putting all the data you have in front of you or a lot of the key data. And when you start to pull it together, then you could start to analyze it and create correlations. Sure. You may not realize that this problem here is closely associated with that problem right. there right. or there's solutions over here that are correlated to those causes there. And we're a large complex city. Right. So it would be the beginning of an effort to start to bring all of those different pieces of data or data sets together and then to start to take questions or ask questions which relate to our citizens' problems or vendor problems and then try to start identifying what the solutions could be for that. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Bunch. Information is knowledge is power. So this is very good. Now there's an internal track and a public track, how's this working out? So from this side of it, when it comes to this open data site or this setup of consolidation, it gives us the opportunity to, number one, share internally. So it could simply be sharing across department. Let's say there's sensitive information or confidential information. That's one uh, uh, capability of it. The second one is certainly to share it openly. And so it gives us the opportunity to choose between them. So for specific data sets, yes, we could share it internally, inherently, but we could also go ahead and publish it out to the public so that they could actually contribute to resolving those issues. Uh, and how, uh, I, think, I don't know if we do this, Mr. Chairman, but, and you said things eloquently. And by the way, you too, Mr. Rosendahl, and I know this is your last budget and finance meeting, so uh, we got to get our money's work with Billy. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, what I was wondering is, Mr. Garcetti, who's a mayor-elect, and I love Mr. Viragosa, uh, but he's got seven days left, how much do you think this would change? Mr. Garcetti is a big app guy, a big information guy, all this stuff, new technology. I mean, he told me my life stopped with Credence Clearwater. That's what he said, Paul, but I will, uh, I'll take that as a compliment. There's so many new things. Do we need to have the new mayor's office look at this, or what does this do? How much will it be enhanced? That's a question, because I think this may be one of his big things. I, I, Steve Reniker, General Manager for IT. I, I think that would be an excellent suggestion, would be to run that through him. We also have the ITA doing a strategic plan that we hope to be rolling out towards the end of July, so this would be a good discussion to, to have with him as well. Uh, that's real good. But information is knowledge is power. It's so important. And there's so much history. And also the history is so important, you know, why certain things are. Be, and I know we've talked about it, so I appreciate what you're doing and surround yourself with good people. So this is a good step, and it's worthy of the investment that we make. And uh, how, uh, in the Southern California, is anyone, I know we mentioned Mr. Bloomberg in New York, but where are we in relation to California? So for open data sharing, San Francisco certainly has been doing that for a few years. So San Francisco is a good example. There's certainly other smaller efforts. Uh, but it's always foggy in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm okay. trying to use the data to, to Yeah, shed to, light to make shed light out. We don't yeah. do that. Good, okay, I'm good. 
So I just want to clarify a few things. The, the 50000 or so is just the ongoing annual cost of maintaining and housing this information. I, yes, I it's, it. a, it's an attempt to consolidate the data and then to maintain and house it there. It would still be responsible for us to, to load the data there, and it would be a secondary step to analyze it and to perform analytics depending on the nature of the problems we're trying to solve. But before getting to that point, presumably there would be an initial cost to launch the program, presumably through an RFP process, I, I'm assuming, is mm -hmm. that right? And that, Correct. So do you we, have any estimate on what that the neighborhood of costs of that RFP process would be? So our, our, our current rough estimates is about 50 to 80 for the first year to go ahead and start that up. Once again, it's, it's like buying a car. If we're going to go ahead and add a bunch of extras to it, it could cost significantly more. But that would be for us to get the site up and running, for us to start loading some of the key data sets. We'd certainly work with key departments. Uh, smaller departments would have a harder time being able to automatically load their data. Larger departments would be impacted, but it should have a reasonable uh, uh, effort to be able to get that in. These are standardized, uh, industry standard, uh, what they call APIs or interfaces to go ahead and load it in. So that is our current uh, best estimate at this point. Okay. Um, so I, I think what I'd like to do is um, is move this forward, but mindful of Mr. Labonge's point, I think, about having uh, the next mayor yep. weigh in and help shape this, and also to try to get as much input as we can from the impacted departments yeah. as to how best to utilize this, how it dovetails with our performance-based budgeting, um, you know, what challenges they currently have in consolidating data, all of those sorts of things, which you've, you've recommended a working group, which I think is exactly right. That's the exact right approach to have. Um, so th I think what I would suggest is uh, the, the first recommendation as proposed is to implement the open data initiative program. Um, I would suggest slightly revising that to, uh, to indicate that we'll initiate uh, the process of developing an RFP to implement the City of Los Angeles open data initiative program, consolidating key data sets from city departments as a foundational step uh, as summarized in the previous Open Data Initiative Feasibility Report to Council and report back to the Budget and Finance Committee with more comprehensive cost analysis based on the dimensions of the RFP uh, first. Um, I think um, that the action to hire the Chief Data Officer is um, at this point premature. I would rather hold off on, on that, but go ahead and establish the departmental working group as defined in recommendation number three um, and, uh, and implement the predictive analytical tools uh, pilot as indicated in number four. I think to, if we can move together that way, move forward that way to council, the rest will come into place after we've done that initial work. But I think you've heard all three of us are strongly supportive of the going in this direction. And it's a question of sequencing, identifying the needs, setting out the mission, clarifying the costs, and then moving forward. So um, if that's clear Just enough, a quick question. Money. Have we ever been hacked on anything? Do you know of? Have we ever been hacked? Hacked. Los Angeles hacked. Yes, our websites have been hacked. Right, and then yes. how, fa how fast do you change it back? You got a hacker looking out for uh, to make sure they don't change. We have a lot of security, pro you know, uh -huh. procedures and processes and tools in place to got it. restore those. And then certain information is confidential, like tax. Like we don't know who the highest paid, highest paying taxpayer is. I think that's confidential. Is that correct? Do we know that? Is the city attorney here? Mr. Echeverria was here earlier on some of that. Pete, do you know that? Just to make sure, because when we walked up through the halls, you know, information is important. But on those issues, some of that is confidential. Is that right, Peter? That is correct. The uh, yeah. the business tax information would be would be confidential, and I believe that there's a, a greater level of security provided for that information. Got it. And the other thing too, with all this stuff going on with the NSA and all that business, are we uh, following all our protocols? You've looked at it again to make sure we don't fall down. Like that seemed yeah, to have happened. Yes, we are. And we, we also uh, annually will go through and do uh, security audits and penetration tests of all of our networks and systems to make sure we're as secure as possible. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. So then, 
as amended, it will be the action of the committee to approve the recommendations. So thank you very much. Did we say something as amended to, to the new mayor? Like the new mayor Sorry. You put yeah. the new mayor? No, no, he did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that good work. That brings us to item number three. Item number three is a budget motion, Wizar Koretz, relative to requesting a report on possible funding sources to restore authority for 16th vacant positions in the office of the city attorney. This, I don't know if there's anybody from the city attorney's office who'd like to Mr. speak on this, but um, this is a request that um, was generated by the office and also by city attorney elect uh, fewer who didn't have the opportunity to weigh in during the normal uh, budget process. Uh, so, Mr. Echeverria, would you like to add anything to this? I would just uh, like to reiterate the, the uh, appeal that we made at the time that this matter was considered as part of the budget process, and that is that our office has experienced tremendous uh, losses of, of personnel over the last three and a half years or so. We've lost an excess of 110 attorney positions, I believe over 180 total positions. Uh, these positions are critical to us. We've hit, essentially we've hit rock bottom in terms of staffing. We need to be able to use these positions in order to replace and, um, and, and, and staff up in some of our areas where we have the greatest needs. Uh, we're not representing that the, uh, re the uh, positions, the, the bodies that would come to fill these positions would necessarily go back to the same division or the same assignment. We're, we will, uh, I believe, and, and I believe the city attorney-elect would, uh, would echo this, we would identify the greatest need and place the, the uh, hires that we would uh, be authorized, we hope, through managed hiring to uh, fill these positions where the greatest need is. And, and at this point in time, at least, I can tell you that we have tremendous needs in both in the litigation area and in various parts of the office with respect to clerks and uh, secretarial support. <laughs> Uh, our, uh, some of our greatest need, for example, for clerks is in the workers' compensation division where it's a very paper-intensive, um, uh, labor-intensive uh, at, at that level um, and uh, in our various litigation uh, sections, including business and complex litigation and our police litigation group where we need attorneys desperately. Our workload has increased and uh, we want to be able to address that. This would give us the flexibility and give the city elect attorney-elect the flexibility to address those needs. Yeah, I'm just Mr. curious, Fuhrer? where's Mr. Fuhrer on this? I feel very comfortable, or although I haven't discussed this issue with him, that he would uh, support this. And I believe that um, he may have a representative here who uh, could speak to that. If... Is, is there anyone here representing the city attorney-elect? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Capri Maddox. I am a deputy city attorney on leave, but I am also a member of the transition team um, for Mr. Fuhrer. So I do want to make it very clear that he is looking forward to having these positions um, replaced to his office. It's kind of impossible to take over with the needs, and basically, as Mr. Echeverria stated, We've experienced a great deal of loss of attorneys and support staff over the years due to ERIP and the economic down, downturn in general. And, and that's all Mr. I need to hear. Mr. Fuhrer, uh, immediately after the election, yeah. contacted me because he didn't have the opportunity to weigh in during the budget right, right, process right, right, right. to reiterate the importance of restoring uh, these positions. And of course, I think there's you know, wide agreement in the need to enhance the city attorney's uh, staff, uh, given the great deal of money that is at stake in our civil litigation practice, and as you pointed out, Mr. Echeverria, the workers' compensation area, which is one of the areas where I think we can make the greatest, make up the greatest ground in reducing expense to the city if we're proactive about it, and, and I don't think we've been able, because of limited resources, we've been able to be proactive enough in reducing those costs. And so um, the one issue is, uh, colleagues, that the motion as it was presented was to attempt to identify uh, funding sources for these 16 positions. I think we should certainly give uh, the new city attorney the flexibility that, that he needs uh, by restoring these uh, positions, but I would recommend that they be, at this point, 
restored as resolution authorities um, it, without a specific uh, funding commitment at this point, and we can deal with that as we move forward through the FSR uh, and, and otherwise. But at this point, uh, I would recommend uh, approval of 16 regular, uh, 16 positions as unfunded resolution authorities, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to make some progress in providing some funding sources and, and ensure that they become more permanent positions as we, as the economy continues to improve. Well, Mr. Rosendahl seconds that and I third it. Is that legal there, Mr. City Attorney? <laughs> you better say or you don't get our uh, vote. Okay? I may have a conflict of interest <laughs> in saying this, but yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I would ask that if, uh, if the chair uh, finds it appropriate that, that perhaps it include informally an instruction to the CAO that if, if funds have not been identified by the first FSR that perhaps the CAO can do that at that time or at least comment on it. Well, um, and the first I, FSR. I, I think we can in, instruct that the CAO report back on or before the next FSR with um, recommendations for funding these positions. Thank you. Okay. And also, the greatest thing, too, this year is we're getting the city attorneys off furloughs. They should never have been Thank on you. furloughs, especially those at the pri uh, proprietary departments. We always okay. should be there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for right. your support, you. council members. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. That will be the action of the committee. Thank you very much. And that brings us then to our final item, uh, item number one. Item number one is an adopted budget recommendation relative to the proposed memorandum of understanding between the zoo and the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association and the instruction to the CAO and CLA to perform a financial analysis of zoo department revenues, membership fees and admissions, and report on any required budgetary adjustments or other related recommendations. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Andrea Galvin, CLA. Pursuant to the council instruction during the budget deliberations for fiscal year 2013-14, the CLA's office has reviewed the proposed MOU for marketing and public relations between the zoo and Glaza. First and foremost, we do recognize the invaluable relationship between Glaza and the zoo. Glaza provides tremendous support and is an integral partner to the zoo. However, the fundamental problem is that the city's ad code requires that the zoo submit marketing and business plans to council for approval in order to have the authority to enter into MOUs. These plans could establish goals to measure success, establish conformance with existing MOUs, and establish appropriate ratios. Until these plans are submitted and approved, it is difficult to determine consistency and conformance with a master plan for the zoo for funding, operations, attendance, fundraising, etc. The second fundamental question is whether the zoo department could, could perform the work and achieve similar program impacts. Marketing staff is already funded within the zoo budget and prior history has shown that when zoo, marketing, when zoo department marketing funds have been increased, attendance was similarly impacted by 5 to 13 percent since 1998. It's important to note that we have come across the issue of the approval of MOUs prior to council approval of marketing and business plans before. In 2005, council approved various MOUs for fundraising, membership, concessions, financial assistance, docent volunteer management, and special events for a 12-month period. At that time, council instructed the zoo to complete a business and marketing plan for approval within this 12-month time frame. These plans were never completed or submitted. Also, the proposed MOU would commit the zoo to further increase zoo admissions in 2014-15 and 2015-16, which would be the seventh and eighth increases in as many years. While we recognize that the first year of the proposed MOU, GLAS would be contributing $2 million of its own resources toward a $2.6 million marketing promotions budget, this dynamic will shift by year three. In 2015-16, the zoo will be funding $2.2 million of a $2.9 million marketing budget, and these funds will be coming from yet-to-be-approved admission fees. Based on these points, the CLA recommends that Council reject the proposed MOU at this time, instruct the zoo to report with a business and marketing plan as required by the Ad Code, retain a larger portion of membership revenues to assist with these activities, Consider contracting out directly for concession site rentals and catering services. 
Further, we instruct the CLA and the CAO and Zoo Department to review all city agreements with Glaza, as well as offline budgets, to ensure conformance with the business and marketing plan when it is approved by council. And finally, we authorize the zoo to expend $800,000 for zoo marketing and public relations and instruct the CAO and CLA to make necessary adjustments in the FSR. The general fund impact of these actions could be completely mitigated by year end. A minimum of $800,000 will be needed for zoo advertising. These costs would be offset by $592,000 that would have been redirected to Glaza under the proposed MOU. The remainder, in addition to other contemplated revenue increases of approximately $300,000, could be offset by increases in attendance, membership, and concession revenue as a result of increased zoo marketing efforts and the opening of new exhibits in fiscal year 2013-14. We're here if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Members, questions for the CLA? We're also going to hear, uh, I'd also like to ask the CAO's office uh, to provide uh, their viewpoint. But yeah, I did get a call for this CLA, Mr. Uh, Miller, on Friday afternoon saying he wasn't going to support this, but he didn't go on as long as you did in reading the letters about all these other issues. I think someone missed the point of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to do a public-private partnership here. And Glaza for almost 50 years has made a difference in this here. And it's extremely important that we uh, carry on, and I believe in committee, and correct me if I'm wrong, and Madam Clerk, you may have to go to the tape. Uh, we talked about this report coming in the first of November, or December, or sometime later in the year. We wanted to try to get this thing done, which is real important. And what the CLA said is more than I believe that we could handle uh, truly right now uh, in the challenges that we have in trying to put the services back in the city. Partnerships are key whether it's the Library Foundation or the Park Foundation or in this case the Glaza, there's nobody has been as good at being a partner for consistently as they have. And in this effort here, I think if they could explain the key numbers, I see the CAO's representatives here, uh, the number of people and also that there's no city job loss there, that they will be uh, press uh, attaches for the zoo, and this is for marketing. Uh, we live in a dynamic region where every day there's somewhere else to go but our own hometown. And I think the partnership that Glaza could provide is absolutely uh, tremendous. So I, I uh, and you did it very eloquently, uh, but I just don't believe if we called that play in the huddle we could score as much as we did as opposed to uh, the relationship that we could have with Glaza and step it up in their contribution. So that's how I feel as someone who's watched this and I haven't been as intimately involved, and I see there's some people who are uh, puffing up a little in the back there and shaking their hand a little bit. I wasn't involved with the CAO's discussion over the course of the six months. I just know that right now, if we don't reach for partnerships, uh, things that are to be what we want won't be there. So uh, I would like to have a minority report if there's not a majority uh, to go to council to say that we should go the other way. if. That is the desire, but I would hope to have the support of the great councilman of the 2nd and the 11th district. Well, I'd like to ask the CAO's uh, office to also uh, chime in. Unless, Mr. Rosendahl, did you have any further questions for the CLA? No. Robin Engel, office of the CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and other council members. Um, just briefly, we, we work well with the CLA's office. We respect uh, them greatly, and we frequently agree with them on... On this matter, we have a slightly different point of view, and we support the work that the zoo and the zoo staff, Glaza and the city attorney have put into uh, this MOU, and we recommend, the CAO recommends maintaining the budget as is, um, allow the MOU to proceed uh, with the recognition that uh, when they uh, come back to ratify it in council uh, later this fall, uh, uh, that if council doesn't approve it, Moving forward at that time, then we make changes in the mid-year FSR. And also, just for a little perspective, um, very briefly, uh, you know, as, as recently as 2009, 2010, the general fund subsidy to the zoo is about 6.5 million. It was 1.3 million in 12, 13, and in 14, 15, uh, the way that it, the budget is structured is at 260 
3,000. Um, I, I, uh, I remember John coming in after the RFP was closed in November uh, as we started the budget cycle and he said, uh, you know, I wish somebody could just tell me where the bottom is so I can start reinvesting and rebuilding in the zoo. And, um, and so we laid out that the, the goal was zero general fund subsidy and he spent the next, uh, you know, whatever that was, four or five months uh, working on uh, a multi-year initiative and, uh, to, with their good partner, Glaza. Uh, Glaza put in $2 million in seed money to kickstart the effort. Um, the uh, increases in revenues that they hope to achieve through this campaign would then fund uh, that effort going forward. And if they exceed their projections, uh, then that money, that extra money that comes in, would reverts back to the zoo. And if for for greater details on maybe some of the points, the zoo directors in a or the city attorney's in a good position to expand on that. Okay, um, Mr. Rosenau. I want to hear from the community and the other people first. first. Okay. Um, Obviously, all right. I see. I agree with the concept of public-private partnerships as a solution going forward. Secondly, Glaza, I've known them for many years in the private sector and in the public sector, and they've been a tremendous partner in a relationship with the zoo. Those are my two backdrop issues. I need to appreciate that we're out here now. Okay. Um, actually, I'd like to ask Mr. Lewis to come up for a moment, too, uh, just to talk uh, briefly about, I mean, the one of the principal concerns uh, I have uh, about this, and, and by the way, I want to reiterate both of my colleagues' comments first. Um, I'm a Glaza member, proudly. Um, I think Glaza has been a tremendous partner of this zoo, and the zoo would not be where it is without the extensive work that Glaza has done in support of the zoo. And um, I think exploring additional ways to partner um, is a, a, an effort that's well worthwhile. Um, I have a couple of procedural and kind of legal concerns here that I want to ask about. The first procedural one, uh, the mayor's proposed budget came out in April and include, included assumptions that were, that included the terms of this MOU, which was then signed the first week of May, but didn't come before, even before this committee until um, May, second week of May, I think. Um, so we were, this committee was kind of left out of that entire process of evaluating um, the MOU, even though it was assumed in the budget. And so concern I have about that, number one, is just a, a, a process one. Um, but more fundamentally than that is that the CLA's report indicates, and I, you know, I'm no expert on this, so I invite anyone's uh, comments on this. But if the administrative code requires that a marketing and business plan, a five-year marketing and business plan, be in place before there is signing authorization on the part of the general man manager, how do we how do we deal with that fundamental issue that there isn't a management and, and uh, a marketing and business plan yet? I, I mean that it's. It, that's not, a, that's not an argument so much on substance as it is just on, on process. I don't know how we get to the point of even being able to evaluate the MOU without such a plan in place. And are, are we legally, I, I shouldn't say we, is, is the general manager even empowered to, to sign an MOU without such a plan in place? So. I, I'll, I'll leave that open to anybody who cares to, to answer, if there's a city attorney's representative who wants to weigh in or, or you know, the, the zoo director or whomever. Uh, that's problem number one. Uh, good afternoon, Councilman. Uh, John Lewis, general manager at the zoo. I'd like to address those questions, and others can too, but uh, first and foremost, address the marketing and business plan. Uh, we, we recognize that that's a requirement in the code, but everybody seems to be you have to read the code letter by letter to understand how the zoo started using our annual budget and uh, get to why we were doing that as our marketing and business plan. The administrative code says that once, at least once every five years, 
that a marketing and business plan has to be developed. Nowhere in the code does it define what the length of that plan is. Particularly in 2008, when budgets just started going crazy, we started utilizing our marketing and business, or excuse me, our annual budget because it was approved by the mayor and the council. So we had some certainty in all of those years of uncertainty what our budget was and what we would have available for marketing, attendance, all of the things, the attendance, the revenues, uh, various things were in our budget proposals. So it was outlined uh, what would normally be in a broader plan. Was that the most desirable? No, but that's the way we were trying to address it. Now, in that context, during that time period, the MOUs that we affected with Glaza were one-year MOUs, just within the context of that budget. You know, that put the burden on us because we had to keep going over and over these MOUs. So that's, that's the way it came and, and why and how we were doing that way and why we, we felt it was legal. Um, this particular uh, MOU, because we are going beyond the one-year time period, it was proposed to be a three-year agreement, we recognized that that required a longer period uh, plan that was approved by the mayor and council, and that's why the uh, MOU in the budget uh, said that it should be uh, reconsidered and uh, approved again by the council by the end of the calendar year once we had that marketing business plan in place. So that was the contingency, but we wanted to get started. We got new exhibits coming on. Uh, the city attorney reviewed that uh, MOU and agreed that that would be allowable under the code. Uh, so that's why we brought it that way. Now, why did you get it at the last minute? In February of this year, after the negotiations with Glaza uh, stopped uh, and the public-private partnership was no longer um, on the agenda, in February, I got a letter from the mayor that ask us to consider ways to, to look at a new model to support the zoo without general fund support and to enhance the relationship with Clausa. There were eight recommendations, or actually they weren't recommendations, they were directives in that letter, and one of those was to work with Clausa to develop a new plan for marketing and advertising the zoo. From that February date until you got the budget, we were literally on a race working on that MOU and getting it done. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the answer as to why it came in so late. Uh, it, was, it included uh, the mayor's office, the CEO's office, the city attorney's office, the zoo, and Glaza. So, I mean, it wasn't anything done in secret. It's just that we had a lot of work to get done in that short time frame. Okay. All right. So let, let me flip that around a little bit now. And um, the final paragraph of the MOU dealing with ratification does, in fact, provide that there's a date certain by which the zoo would prepare a more thorough, let's say, marketing and business plan uh, for five years. Um, and that needs to be done by November. And then it would, have, it would be subject to council approval. If council does not approve that plan, then the MOU is null and void, right. as I understand it, correct? Is that, is that, that's our understanding, yeah. yes. So if that's the case, um, what would be the harm of approving the agreement now, knowing that if we disagree with it a few months from now, we could simply cancel it. First of all, if, if that's the case, I want to you know make sure everyone agrees with the reading of that, that that would be the case. And if so, in what way would the city be prejudiced by initially entering into an MOU such as this if um, we have a second bite at the apple when there's a marketing plan done. I don't think there is. I think it gives us the uh, inertia to get started on this and start developing our plan, start marketing the zoo, try to get more people to the zoo, more revenues to the zoo. And we understand we're under the, the onus to prov provide a good plan that the council and the mayor are going to agree to um, and, and go forward. Uh, the downside to the zoo is that um, if, we are, if we are relegated back to the $800,000 a year that we have for marketing and, and PR, um, that doesn't assume that we're going to have any growth. This additional revenue is what's focusing on trying to get more people to the zoo, therefore more revenues. If we have the same level, uh, I don't think we can make those same assumptions. There is some confusion, uh, and I grant that this is a, a difficult thing, but the, the budget that was illustrated uh, in the MOU is an estimate based on averages. 
if you compare that against our existing budget, there looks like there's some disparity there that we're not reaching far enough with the MOU. The budget is illustrative. The point being is any funds that we exceed based on that illustration, all these revenues uh, from admissions come through the zoo's enterprise trust fund, which means they stay with the city. So if there's more money, we keep that money, and only the agreed upon amount goes back to Galazzo. Ms. So, did you want to weigh in on this? It looked like you. Just, just that if you were to approve the MOU, um, at some point down the future, perhaps like in February, if you do see the business and marketing plan, and it turns out that it is not consistent with the MOU that you adopted, I guess the question would be, would there be a will at that time to actually cancel the MOU? And halfway through the year, um, you would have a situation where um, the, all of the business and marketing has already been done by um, Glaza, uh, and that the zoo department would have to pick it up mid-year. Um, it, it just seems a little bit a cart before the horse. Um, usually, usually, I mean, Mr. Lewis is correct in the sense that there isn't a specific time frame for the business and marketing plan. It doesn't specifically state that it needs to be five years. What it does say is that one should be submitted every five years. And um, the last time that the council did approve uh, the various MOUs, the last time it was with the understanding that um, the business and marketing plan would be submitted within that year. Um, we have not seen it to this date. Um, just as, as I read this, there wouldn't be a need by the council to cancel the MOU. It would be no if its own, by its own operation, if the council fails to approve a marketing plan. So, um, so we wouldn't have to affirmatively cancel it. It would it would simply be null and void if uh, if we don't meet those deadlines of approving the marketing plan. So um, that's a little a little less onerous than actively. Uh, canceling something. And then there would have to be a determination made at that time as to who would resume the marketing function. Right. Right. But we're kind of having to face that decision right now as well and whether or not to fund the $800,000 to, to fill that gap. So um, I'm not sure how different it would be then than it is now. Um, but Mr. Kretz uh, has joined us. So I want to give him an opportunity to weigh in as well, or ask any questions that you have. Yeah, I, I don't know if this question was already asked, but uh, where is the five-year business plan? Where does it stand? And why isn't it before us here in committee? Well, we have to we have to find out what our status is relative to this MOU. I, the the marketing business plan has to come forward, as you state but we're kind of waiting to see where we're at, whether we're doing a plan with Glaza or without Glaza. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Well, I would think we'd want to see this plan before we approve the MOU. So from my point of view, I would expect to wait for that before uh, we approve anything. We... Okay. I don't know if you want me to restate what I stated, Councilman or Mr. Chair, you know, regarding his question, but or just wait. Yeah, that, that's fine. I, please go right ahead. Yeah, and, and I, before you came in, Councilman, we were trying to explain how we got to this point. And as I explained, we've been in kind of a race since February when uh, I received a letter from the mayor uh, post negotiations regarding the public private partnership with Glaza. Uh, to do several things, eight different points, and one of them was to uh, work out an agreement and relationship with Glaza regarding increasing the marketing and PR functions at the zoo. Literally from that date until budget and finance got it during our hearing, that's what we were racing to do. Uh, based on the city attorney's opinion at the time, recognizing that without the plan, uh, we could not have a long-term MOU, they said that if we made it contingent on ratification by the council when we brought that plan forward, by the end of the calendar year, I can't say why they picked that date, but that was the, the contingency that we, the council could move forward with this MOU. Yeah, actually, it would have to be brought forward by November 1, and the yeah. council would act, have to act by the end Correct. of the year. Um, 
Mr. Miller, did you, I just saw that you had arrived. Did you want to add anything at, at the moment? Okay. Uh, why don't we go ahead and hear from the members of the public then, and then we'll come back uh, with additional discussion and questions. Uh, our first speaker is Jeannie Vassells, who will be followed by Carmen Hayes Walker. <coughs> Hello, I'm Jeannie Vassals. I'm Vice President for Institutional Advancement for the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association. And I'm here to give you a statement today on behalf of Richard Lichtenstein, our co-chair of our, of our trustees. Who is with us, by the way? He's in the back. <laughs> Come on out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Connie Morgan, our Glossa President. In the face of declining city funding, the Glaza Board of Trustees firmly believes that this is the moment to strengthen the Los Angeles Zoo's long-term financial outlook. To ensure the zoo's robust future, a significant and immediate financial investment in an aggressive strategic marketing plan is absolutely necessary to enable the zoo to expand its audiences and increase its earned revenues. With the active oversight of the mayor, the CAO, the city attorney, the zoo director and Glaza have agreed upon a detailed business and marketing plan that presents the city and the zoo with opportunities to benefit from new income streams that will support the operations and programs of the Los Angeles Zoo. This plan is based on realistic growth projections that demonstrate the expanded financial benefits a strategic marketing investment can generate. Los Angeles is an immensely and intensely competitive leisure market that requires a significant marketing investment in order to be heard. The zoo's current marketing budget is merely one-tenth of the budgets of comparable Los Angeles attractions and only one-third of the average budgets of zoos nationwide. It is critical that the Los Angeles Zoo's message reach a wider audience to expand its audience and strengthen its financial base. Glaza has identified the financial resources to jumpstart a creative and effective plan to raise the zoo's earned revenues through new marketing initiatives. The generous donors who contribute money to Glaza have made it very clear that they expect Glaza to exercise fiscal and creative control over these donations to achieve the most effective results for the zoo and its programs. As evidenced by our expanding success in raising revenues through sponsorships and our okay. financial strength and stability, Glaza's experienced entrepreneurial and results driven team is optimally suited to launch okay. these new marketing okay. initiatives. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And, and members, uh, written version of the statement is uh, before you. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Carmen Hayes Walker. I'm Vice President of Ask Me Local 3090. Ask Me rep represents approximately 35 members who work for the zoo, including administrative support, the curators, and the veterinarians. We believe we need to keep the zoo public and make it self-sufficient with a regular source of revenue that is not dependent on the city's budget. We also believe that in order to protect both the zoo and the city, full and complete transparency of municipal marketing plan slash contract is way too important to ignore. Cost analysis benefits are needed to get the best deal for the city. We don't even know how much money is at stake. What is the rush? Therefore, we agree with the CLA report, and we urge you to reject the MOU that is before you today. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is James Johnson, followed by Victor Gordo. Good afternoon, James Johnson, SAU Local 721. I'll be extremely brief. Um, I'm trying to understand what the issue is. Either you got to have a business plan or you don't. If you don't have to have a business plan, then why am I here where 
are these other folks here. Bottom line is that, you know, pseudo proprietary departments such as the zoo, if it says that there needs to be a business plan, then there needs to be a business plan in place. We're not talking about that which happened in 2007, 2008. I even preface the fact that many departments obviously have been struggling since recession with ERIP and the like, and folks have been trying to go around the corners to try to figure out how to make their operations run. But the the former um, controller, um, Chick, as well as um, the current controller, um, going back to 2002, have been asking the same question. Unless I'm wrong, and I could be wrong, you know, but where's the plan? They've been asking that. It isn't here. Until there is a business plan, you should reject the uh, MOU. It's frankly, when you get right down to it, not that simple, but when you really get down to it, it really is, and we need to keep it simple. Thank you. Our next speaker is Victor Gordo, followed by Dr. Molly Rhodes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the City Council. Um, let me first commend the CLA for a very well done uh, piece of staff work. This is the first piece of staff work that I've seen in quite some time that doesn't dictate to you, based on some uh, crisis, what to do, but in fact uh, advises you to take a step back and meet your fiduciary obligation, and I think that's commendable on the part of the CLA to provide such a comprehensive report. Uh, the department's position that we can review the MOU, um, I'm sorry, the uh, business plan la later on is absolutely inconsistent with your fiduciary obligation. You're to review the MOU relative to the plan, not the other way around. Uh, the working group that was put together by the City Council uh, some time ago recommended an RFP on business intelligence and municipal marketing. Uh, that seemed to, seems to have gone away and now found its way into an MOU that uh, is before you. We're, we're asking that you adopt the CLA's recommendations and reject the MOU. Um, th put simply, you don't know the value of this contract. You know the value of an MOU, but this MOU then gives the right to an organization to enter into subcontracts that you have no idea what the value is. Pouring rights, business intelligence, municipal marketing, you should have all of those matters before you before you enter into this agreement. Uh, and, and you're correct, Mr. Chair, that it's our position that the general manager has no authority to enter into this MOU absent a, uh, a business and marketing plan. If you look at page four of the uh, report, um, it makes it very clear in the some the council has never approved a marketing plan, um, and it's required by the administrative code, administrative code in order for the general manager to have the authority to enter into an MOU. Uh, we ask that um, you direct the department to do exactly that and that you return uh, with full transparency so that we can all understand what exactly is included in this MOU. Thank you. Uh, the last card that I have, the last card that I have at the moment, anybody who'd like to speak, bring one forward. The last card that I have is Dr. Molly Rhodes. Hi. Um, I, I want to follow on um, some of the things that Victor talked about. Um, first of all, I was interested to hear Mr. Lewis reference the letter from um, the mayor in February. I would flag for the committee that number six of the letter instructed him to um, respond to the opportunities that will be identified in the zoo working group report scheduled to be released in the near future. Um, that release never happened because the completion never happened. Um, we were at the zoo commission a month ago and um, there was confusion about whether it was his responsibility to release it or not, but it's in the mayor's letter. Um, related to the specific item of business intelligence that um, um, Victor mentioned, um, and Mr. Kerkorian directly responding to your question of what's the harm of um, uh, passing this now if, if it can be undone later. The danger is that if this is authorized now and stands now, Glaza proceeds to enter into subcontracts. If you look at page three of the MOU in the marketing research section, the first bullet point reads, upon approval of this MOU, Glaza will review the market research recently obtained by the zoo. Based upon that information, Glaza will conduct additional market research necessary to develop a new positioning platform, including research that will target current zoo attendees and non-attendees to identify and prioritize 
new multi-ethnic target audiences, as well as reveal the public's current opinions, perceptions, and misperceptions of the zoo. Glaza has secured a proposal for this additional research and will complete it within six weeks of its commencement. So if you don't hold this MOU for the business plan, Glaza has the right to proceed to enter into other MOUs to which the city is not a party and will never see. So that's our issue. Well, just on that point, yeah. well, that's their problem, isn't it? I mean, if they go and contract... No, because if, they, if it wait, doesn't... Wait, 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 wait. If they go and subcontract with somebody and our contract says that the city has no further obligation, it's on their dime, isn't it? Here's the other problem. This MOU has no termination clause. Um, there's... I, I, I'm not asking about that. I'm just, just asking a specific question in response to your point. If they're going to go and subcontract, that's their problem. That's going to come out of... If, if we have no obligation to, under the MOU... If they subcontract, that's their risk, not the zoo's risk, seems to me. Right. I but could be wrong. On, on the issue of business intelligence, we don't understand why it's better to have a secret process that's not transparent, isn't clear to the public. Okay. That, that's another set of issues. But okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, members. Well, I support the uh, CAO. I appreciate everybody's uh, comments. Uh, I think uh, uh, the public-private partnership is necessary, and the uh, ability to do creative things often uh, allows us to do that. Our success in this region, whether it's in the Hollywood Bowl or at the Natural History Museum or other county facilities and some partial city facilities, is the partnership. In this particular case here, there's nobody that has exceeded, and maybe all the others combined do not match what Glaza has done. I feel the, uh, the uh, oversight uh, would be necessary, and I count on the new mayor's office, because the last mayor's office, I see a deputy mayor, I think, who came in there. I don't know if you're still a deputy mayor, but, uh, you know, there's a discussion. You've got seven more days, Matt. Good luck. Okay. So the discussion is important. You know, on this here, I just want to say my door is always open, and I am absolutely for public-private partnerships, especially on cultural things that get cut, cut, cut. When the CAO expressed that they went from uh, multi-millions of dollars assignment down to under a million in the next fiscal year, they got to ask for ways to how to create that opportunity. And I think it takes us uh, in a situation where we could guarantee uh, that uh, we could have city services that the city wants, but the partnerships are necessary in these areas as well. So uh, that's how I strongly feel, and I would hope we could have a majority support uh, out of this committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Kress, anything further? Well, I, I think there are a lot of potential benefits to working with GLAS on doing this partnership, but I think it's I'm at least concerned that we're giving something away without knowing exactly what we're getting into without a business plan. So I'm happy to consider this when a business plan is before us. I'm very queasy about doing anything without that. Okay. I would just like to the staff one more time. Jerry, since you came in the room, your position on this issue here. I happen to be leaning... Uh, obviously to Lhasa and its historic relationship, but the unions matter and workers matter. So let's clear it up a little bit, Jerry. Uh, certainly. My uh, apologies. I was juggling meetings, so I didn't hear the presentation. I don't know if I'm going to be restating what's already been stated. Okay. Um, I, you know, to be very clear, um, uh, you know, I, I go to the, the uh, LA Zoo Bond Oversight Committee meetings monthly. I think Glaza does an absolutely terrific job. Uh, and I think the relationship between Glaza and the zoo um, uh, is stronger than it's ever been. There was a period of time where there, that was a difficult relationship, and we had difficulties with zoo management. Those issues are now gone. What really it comes down to, in our view, uh, is that the ad code, which was it, essentially it's the council policy, the council's mayor's policy, uh, and it states very clearly that in order to enter into MOUs, that a business and marketing plan needs to be submitted and approved by the mayor and the council. So certainly I'm not in a position to recommend to you that you ignore the established policy in the administrative code. No, I do think that it's that. important in order no, to... When you raise this in the bureaucratic process before it purples up to us, what answers did you get? 
Well, again, we were unaware that the MOU existed until we were in the middle of budget hearings. Um, and, uh, you know, it, clearly the, this committee was concerned at the time and asked us to come go back and take a look at it. I think we indicated at the time we could be back before, uh, you know, the end of the fiscal year with a, with a report, but it would be difficult to judge uh, or to evaluate the MOU and whether it's accomplishing the goals and objectives from a business and marketing standpoint without having the business and marketing plan before you. Again, conceptually, uh, philosophically, there's no issue with it. Again, I think Glaza does a terrific job. Our only position to you is that we would advise that it would be preferable to be able to evaluate the MOU in the context of the business plan uh, and to ensure that the money flowing uh, to the zoo and that the taxpayers are benefit from. Why would uh, Glaza be against it? What's their problem with that analysis? Richie, do you want to get up and speak? Well, I would think they're anxious because we have been hey, talking well, about them, but I want to... Well, let me, let me try add. to maintain a modicum of order here, please. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, Mr. Lichtenstein, if you'd like to come forward and please respond to Mr. Rosendahl's question. Thank you very much, Rich Lichtenstein, uh, uh, co-chairman of Glaza. Um, Glaza, as you know, has been a long-standing partner uh, with the Zoo Association, uh, with the city. Uh, we continue to want to, uh, to move forward with, uh, uh, with the city family to do the best possible work we can. Uh, we were set on a mission for several years um, by, by this city government to pursue a privatization at the zoo, uh, which this council chose to, uh, to bring to an end. The MOU came about at the suggestion of, uh, of the mayor's office, the CAO's office. We negotiated that MOU with the department, the city attorney, the CAO. Council office was familiar with, uh, with our, uh, our efforts. We are ready to move forward to try to make our zoo, your zoo, our zoo, the best possible experience uh, possible. We need tools in order to do that. For us to continue to sit and wait on the sidelines uh, while the city is trying to decide which path to pursue makes no sense to us. We are prepared to spend $2 million of private money to enhance the reputation and the uh, marketability of this facility. That's There's membership money. That's not from somebody in a... Private sector money, Councilman. But it's membership money. It's people... The, this is money that we, that we have raised. We have raised those dollars uh, from the private sector, and we will continue to reinvest based on the MOU. Some of it will come from, uh, from the increase, uh, should this city council choose to, uh, to uh, elect to do so, from increase in admission prices. We'll continue to invest. But the initial $2 million are dollars that we, Glaza, have raised that we're prepared to put into marketing this facility. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the San Diego Zoo in our marketplace spends three, four, five million dollars um, alone in our market. And nobody knows about our zoo. There is no reason for our workforce, who we love dearly, to be concerned about this matter. And to me, I don't even understand the issue. Uh, I don't understand their concern. I, I certainly did understand their concerns about privatization when there were jobs that were potentially at risk. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, a long answer to a short question. I just want to know why Jerry wasn't in the room with the others. He all could have worked this out. Well, there's a deputy mayor here. You were involved. You want to speak for the mayor? You were involved in that, Matt. You know, you that, took this is not a way to conduct a hearing. I'm sorry, but we're not going to talk to people in the back row and have them speak back. I would, um, but, Mr. Chairman, just to let you know, he is a deputy mayor for yeah. the mayor of Los Angeles. He That's was involved. It's he go came into the meeting. I'm just trying to get some facts for Mr. Okay. Rosendahl. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so a couple of questions uh, that I have, actually, that I can, um, and now I've lost my train of thought. I had a couple of questions for Rich, and now I've lost it. Um, the $800,000 that's currently budgeted, maybe actually this is more for Mr. Lewis. The $800,000 that, that's currently in the budget, uh, I have in my uh, notes here for advertising. Is that inclusive of all marketing? 
or just advertising? It's a, yeah, it's a contract we have with an outside agency that does the creative and buys media for us for advertising and marketing, yes. Okay. Um, what, given the fact that the mayor did uh, instruct you back in February to develop the comprehensive strategic plan and work on these other issues, what is the earliest that we would be able to have an actual marketing and business plan? I'm not sure I can answer the question on the earliest. Obviously, the latest is November 1st, and we understand that, but our intent isn't to wait for that date, but to try to bring it in as soon as possible. Okay. So I, I, I really don't have an answer for you in that All regard. Right. Okay. Um, oh, and with regard to the opportunities that were identified by the Zoo Working Group, which, as I've mentioned before it was a I thought a very productive um, example of management and labor and stakeholders working together to try to find uh, some creative out-of-the-box uh, thinking right. uh, what is the status of that report and when might this committee be able to consider it my answer is I don't know uh, so let me get to how I get to that answer <laughs> Um, I agree. There was a lot of good work that was done in those meetings. There were a lot of good ideas, but they weren't mutually exclusive ideas, and that's kind of a surprise when I hear somehow there's this ownership that the ideas out of that meeting can only come out a certain way. Uh, we repeatedly talked about parallel activities that were going on at the zoo in Glaza, specifically talking about sponsorships. Um, Part of the reason in the MOU that we, we kind of lumped in the, the business intelligence and the membership uh, material is, is a request on my part of Glaza to, to uh, purchase and utilize software that would allow them to um, uh, put barcodes on their memberships so we can see who's coming, who, how many times they're using the memberships, all of those. So it's the same type of thing. So we'd be collecting information on our regular visitors as well as membership. Uh, to better manage the zoo and also achieve more revenues. The report got lost when, because the original intent was to bring out the report at the same time that the proposal for the uh, public-private partnership was going to come to council. Once that stopped, the deadline and the scheduling on the report got lost. Uh, Ms. Uh, Molly's right that in the letter the mayor said to bring that thing forward. Uh, we are trying to bring it forward with the CAO and everybody else that's involved, but it hasn't come forward. Okay. All right. Mr. Zabel, Mr. Zabel my apologies. If you would like to <laughs> offer uh, any comments, please come to the microphone and you may do so. If not, that's okay too. Uh, not Thank you. Um, all right. So um, I guess what, here's what I'm thinking, and especially in, in response to your last comment, Mr. Lewis. We've had... Um, multiple tracks here. We've had the zoo working group and proposals, we've had uh, the MOU, uh, and we have the um, idea of some of the ideas that were presented in the CLA report about direct uh, contracting by the zoo with um, other contractors to, to try to achieve some of the marketing results. All of these have costs and benefits. Um, all of these have comparative uh, advantages and I think in all of them we have inadequate um, projections of likely outcomes. Um, to me this just hasn't none of these options have really been vetted by this committee to, to my satisfaction. Um, and uh, I think all of them offer um, real promise, but we're just kind of behind the eight ball when we're uh, given these things without a marketing plan, without uh, the other sorts of real budgetary projections that are at a level of substance that I would feel comfortable with. Um, so I recognize the need to continue this discussion. Let me ask you this, Mr. Miller, actually. Take one step back. There's been some discussion 
among some that if no action is taken by the council, the MOU automatically goes into effect July 1st. In my view, the MOU by its own terms requires ratification by the council. Um, and if there is no action, that it would not go into effect July 1st. Now that might put the department into a budgetary problem because the budget assumed that it would go into effect, but we could remedy that in a budgetary way um, without rejecting the MOU or ratifying it. In other words, if we were to continue discussion about discussion and analysis by the M about the MOU and take care of the marketing uh, expense issue, we don't need to take the step of rejecting the MOU, uh, but rather we can continue to do the cost benefit and economic analysis ne necessary to uh, to consider it properly and hopefully get a marketing plan as well. well I'll, I'll let uh, Sharon address that, but we've been advised that uh, unless it's rejected before July 1st, the MOU has been executed and it would go into effect. So um, if it was the committee's desire to not ratify rather than to take uh, an outright rejection, you could take an action to not ratify the MOU, basically saying that the MOU is not going into effect on July 1. But at the same time, as a result of that, you have um, the marketing uh, issue or um, be kind of in a, it's in limbo. So you, in conjunction with any action to actually um, hold this or actually to um, uh, not ratify, there would need to be a companion recommendation with regard to uh, the public relations to, and marketing to actually direct somebody to undertake that effort. Um, if it was the desire of this committee to direct the zoo to do that, then there would need to be some authorization to the zoo department to actually expend money for the purposes of uh, doing the marketing function until um, the um, business and marketing plan is submitted and then until uh, uh, MOU is reviewed to, uh, to be determined to be in conformance with that business and marketing plan. Yeah, so. but so, so under that scenario, I mean, especially because uh, recommendation number four already provides for that under your recommendations, there's no magic drop-dead impact of July 1st. If we were to provide the funding as suggested in in item four, and if the marketing and business plan comes back on July 2nd, we could act on July 3rd, uh, if it satisfied us, to ratify the MOU. Could we not? I mean, there's, there's no magic to these dates, as far as I'm, except the self-imposed magic that the terms of the MOU include. But it specifically says it's subject to ratification, and, it's, and the ad code provides that the signing authority is subject to uh, our approval of a marketing and business plan. If we haven't approved a marketing and business plan and we haven't ratified the MOU, it doesn't go into effect, in my view. So it's not like by July 1st it either exists or doesn't exist. We could proceed with this, get a marketing and business plan, consider the, consider the working group's options, assess those various options, and, you know, if the MO you seems to be the best option after getting the marketing plan. Um, we could do that in a week. We could do it August 1st. We could do it July 15th. You could make that finding that it is not effective until all of these things happen. Yes, you can do that. So we can vote positively today with that as an understanding that those steps are going to be followed. If you were to make a finding that it does not go into effect until these things happen, and in the meantime uh, make a similar recommendation to actually instruct someone to do the business and marketing and, and PR effort in the interim, um, that would be a positive way of taking action. Yes. Okay. Mr. Lubach. Would we instruct the CAO to do that? Because they've had more day-to-day -day experience in this as opposed to the CLA? Huh? No. To, to do to oversee to, do to oversee that to do the marketing? No, no, they're doing the marketing plan. I'm talking about to oversee it. You got to present it to somebody, correct, Mr. Miller? They present it to you or to the CAO? It would be presented to the council. I know, but for you first, you work it out. You got to solve these problems before they get here. That's the key. We would absolutely sure. review it at but your direction. Would the and and the CAO? 
Absolutely. I'm looking at the CIO. Yeah. No. But I want to. Yeah. I just. I, I just want. I just trying to make everybody be on the pain. Everybody should take a big breath now. Right now, we're trying to do what's right for what we believe, and not all of us agree we're on the same page. But as we all take our breath as we move forward, we want to get back here again. That's all I'm just trying to get yeah, for the table. Uh, I'm with you. In the marketing plan, I would want to be analyzed by the CAO's office, by the COA's office, and considered by this committee. Absolutely. Good. I'll move forward. Mr. So, Chair, can I comment, please? Yes, Mr. I'm, I'm having a hard time taking a breath. Um, this is the kind of thing that's been frustrating for the zoo for the last six years. Uh, we talk about a plan, yet every time we come to council and the mayor for our budgets, the budget doesn't look anything like the needs that we need at the institution. We came in here with some solutions. It's been affirmed by the city attorney that it is the legal way to proceed. We can get started and we can achieve these things and we're held accountable to date certain. The other thing in the report that was frustrating for the zoo is it once again dredges up things that have been addressed over and over, whether it's should we uh, directly contract for concessions. Two audits, we have responded to that. Most recently in 2009, and the Audits and Government Efficiency Committee and the Council received and filed those responses. Likewise, on the annual uh, budget being used for the marketing business plan during that time, the response was made. It was explained why we were doing that. It was received and filed by the council. So it goes back to what uh, Robin was saying when I asked, show me the base. I mean, what are the expectations? I know the main expectation about the marketing and business plan. The rest of it, as far as I'm concerned, is just piling on. I think we need to get to this and get it done. And if we don't make it, then we'll suffer the consequences. Okay. All right. Well, my problem is this. I'm leaving the council. This is my last uh, budget meeting. Uh, I love LASA. LASA has been a significant, in my eight years here and in the private sector, a player in keeping our zoo going. Good, bad, the ugly, and budgets and not budgets, CLA, CAO, all this other stuff, the relationship with that group of citizens uh, who care about animals and care about nature is phenomenally impressive. And I don't think there's any other city in the nation that has such a strong sense of community. Labor, I love labor. I believe in organized labor. I believe in a living wage. I believe in, in, in workers. But, but there's got to be a, a, a consensus here that the lot, that Gaza is good. We gotta say that and figure out how we integrate that into this process. Right. So as Mr. Labonge would like to say, a win, win, win where everybody comes out ahead of it. So, you know, my position is to stay close to Tom on this one. Well, I just want to ask this sure, about what go Mr. Ahead. Lewis did say. That, well, I did, your deputy wrote, read your report, Mr. Miller, and it was eloquent. Yeah. But, about, about, but there was a lot of additional things that we didn't talk about that we talked about on Friday that showed me had a problem. And I, I think that John just mentioned as far as reviewing again. I think we're focused on the business plan to enhance the uh, awareness of this great, beautiful, uh, zoological, uh, botanical gardens that is operated by the city yeah. to encourage people. Because I truly believe, if you look back at the history of Southern California, it was absolutely a, a marketing plan that San Diego did to take everybody to San Diego to fill up Motel Circle. Absolutely, that's why we all would go down there. We got one of the greatest zoos in the world and one of the greatest staffs in our city's zoo. I got all that. But all the extra, if that could be defined or line and marketing, how are you going to educate the public? Are you going to use Channel 5 in the morning? Or are you going to show us 11 at night? Whatever you're going to do to get the people here, that's the key. So uh, that's the thing that I want to do because I do agree with Mr. Lewis's statement. There seem to be a few extra uh, things mentioned that we've already resolved. All right. Well, I, I think there's probably unanimity here in um, affirming what Mr. Rosendahl just said about Glaza's contribution to the zoo. I, I, so, you know, any of this discussion, in my view, I don't know if, if there's disagreement, but in my view is not a question about whether or not Glaza has made a significant contribution to the zoo. As I started my comments, I, the zoo would not be where it is without uh, the great work that Glaza has done. That's in my view, not the issue. It's a question of really just having the facts before us. And, um, you know, I, I dwell on that 
in everything that we talk about. So um, it's clear to me that there's at least two members who want to move forward uh, with the memorandum of understanding. Um, my recommendation would be uh, to um, adopt the CLA's recommendations with a few changes. Uh, I would amend uh, item one uh, to defer rather than reject the proposed memorandum of understanding. I would uh, change that language to uh, defer ratification of the memorandum of understanding um, for 60 days. I would uh, add an instruction to, in, instruction to instruct the zoo department to report with marketing and business plans. Um, I would ask that a marketing and business plan uh, return to this committee within 60 days. Um, and then uh, go ahead with three and four as recommended. And then I would also request that within uh, 60 days the um, report on the, zoo, the opportunities identified in the zoo working group uh, also be reported uh, to this committee as well. And so... Uh, I'll second that if you need to second. So there will be two of us with that recommendation, two of us recommending moving forward with the uh, con ratification of the MOU, um, as is. So, um, right, Mr. Rosendahl? Well, I'm up for discussion when we vote on it in the council. Yeah. Some of the suggestions you just made because they were thoughtful, but I don't want to stop this from going Right, forward. exactly. So that, that will be the action. There will be a report by Mr. LeBonge and Mr. Rosendahl uh, confirming ratification of the MOU, and there will be a report by the chair and uh, Mr. Koretz along the lines that I just stated. I believe with this committee, with a two and two, the item will need to go forward as being submitted without a recommendation. And these amendments from the members will need to be done on the council floor. Call it a 50-50 recommendation. Well, all right, then we'll advance it without recommendation, but mm -hmm. we can include these, this body of information within the report. Yes, we can. Okay. And it's scheduled in council on Wednesday this week. Day after tomorrow. Correct. Okay. So that will be the action of... Uh, the committee. Now, before we conclude, though, I'd like to um, ask that we reconsider items 4, 5, 6, and 7. Those were consent items, Mr. Kretz. And as those matters are now before this committee for a vote, I would, I would like to turn the, turn the gavel over, turn the chair over to Mr. Rosendahl. And as I do so, and... Uh, and ask him to chair this committee uh, as we conclude. I just want to thank you, Mr. Rosendahl, for your many, many years of extraordinary service to this committee. Um, you have been a steadfast uh, voice and conscience of this committee. Uh, the work that you've done for the people of this city and bringing us to where we are uh, with our budget is uh, difficult to quantify. Uh, but we all are incredibly grateful for your service. And uh, I'd like to ask you to close the meeting out, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, with uh, concluding items 4, 5, 6, and 7, our consent items, and uh, also with our thanks and appreciation for all of your extraordinary work. So moved on the last item, uh, unanimous support for those four. I have that. Thank you. So hey. moved. I want to thank everybody in the world of budget and finance that we've been playing around, and I have, for eight years, uh, to see the dynamic, the energy. Frankly, we're only as good as the staff is in presenting information to us and then trying to dissect it and figure out what's in the best interest of the community. So it's been a, a privilege and an honor frankly, to have eight years working for the people in Los Angeles. And thank you. And thank you, Tom. Thank you, Billy. Love you. Love you, too. And Paul Koretz and I go way back. So we're old cronies from the 70s and 80s. Uh, and, of course, Paul Krikorian is a bright light and a new light to our city. And we're very happy to have you as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, meetings adjourned. There you go. <laughs>